In today's video, we're going to be taking this folding fat tire e-bike on a trail-only range test. This is not going to be another cookie cutter range test where I carelessly drain the battery to zero in an unpractical attempt to give you a number. Instead, I'm going to give you numbers for real world situations for somebody who actually cares about the longevity of their bike. Although the trail ride in this video is not something I would consider to be pushing the bike to its limits, it's certainly something you wouldn't do every day. However, we're going to practice some techniques that won't stress the battery or motor, and you could expect to repeat this many times. If you're new to electric bikes or considering getting one, there's some important information in this video that you should consider. These electric bikes are unique, and there's a special way you can take care of them to get them to last a very long time. Now I'm by no means an expert on electric bikes, but the community is a wealth of information that I've gathered, and I also have years of experience working with lithium-ion batteries, which is what's used to power most, if not all, electric bikes. The bike we'll be riding today is the Orion from WTVA Bikes. WTVA did send us this bike for testing and to make some creative videos on. This will not affect our opinions, and we will be addressing some concerns we had in our previous video. During the trip, I estimate that we used about 70% pedal assist, and then I occasionally took a break on throttle only. Now, I chose to use a trail simply to take advantage of the fat tires on this bike. Admittedly, I could have gotten considerably more range on smooth streets. But if you purchased a fat tire bike, you probably had something like this in mind. I won't spoil whether or not we made it back with power, but our planned trip was 15 miles out on trail only and then 15 miles back, plus an additional 2 miles to get from the house to the trail. You can count that if you like. During the ride, I'll explain why I came to this exact distance, but I'll also provide you with a chart that will help you out because it certainly helped me. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Before we get to the ride though, I would like to address some concerns I had about the bike in my first impressions video, linked in the description. The only modification I've made to the P settings on this bike is I adjusted the wheel size. Out of the box it was reading about 2 miles an hour fast, so I matched it up with my GPS. I did this right away so that I could have an accurate odometer reading. And including today's adventure, we currently have 160 miles on the odometer. So far the bike's been a little tank. Now I don't abuse my bike, but I do put them through situations that most of you probably won't. So far, the only issue I've had with the bike is that the headlight stopped working. I could have probably reached out to WTVA to get a new one, but honestly, the one that comes with the bike is pretty weak. I only find it useful at pedal assist level 2, which is 12 miles an hour. Beyond that, it's just not bright enough to trust going any faster. So, because I planned on upgrading it anyways, not a big deal. The bike is certainly sturdy, so I wasn't concerned about its integrity. However, I was concerned about the potential water exposure to the speed controller. It's mounted in an exposed location, and as far as I could tell at first, there was no waterproofing on this compartment. However, I was pleasantly surprised to open it up and find out that not only is the speed controller at the very least water resistant with silicone around the wires and the silicone seal on the edges, but there is a drain hole at the bottom of this compartment so that if water does get in here, it should slowly make its way out. With that being said, I was glad that I checked because we found some issues with the wiring. This compartment is relatively small for the speed controller and all the wires that need to go in here, and it turns out they were rubbing up against the sidewalls and slowly eating away at the insulation. Now I addressed this issue in my own way, but keep in mind this was only at about 130 miles before we went on the adventure, and this amount of damage could have certainly caused a catastrophic issue down the road. To help better protect the wires, I smoothed out any rough edges that they might catch on and I added a bit of rubber between the speed controller and the wall of the compartment. After that task was complete, I wanted to address a little bit of noise that this bike was making. Some of the main cables run through these large loops. This was causing excessive rattling that bothered me, but I'm also glad that I checked this as well because it looks like some of the rubbing was getting into the insulation here as well. I use this bike mostly for short trips to and from work, but I have given it a handful of full throttle runs just for fun. I was pleasantly surprised to see that the XT60 connector showed no signs of heat damage. It came apart quite easily, but had enough resistance not to rattle itself loose. And the motor wire, also same situation. No signs of heat damage. 
Our trip starts right around sunrise. In proper Louisiana fashion, we're in the low 90s for today's ride with our expected humidity around 80%. It's gonna be hot. For our relaxed style of riding, these temperatures won't affect the speed controller or motor, but they can actually give you a slight boost in your battery's performance. But it's never a good idea to keep one of these lithium ion batteries at full charge during hot temperatures. Because we're using the battery's power right away, this won't affect us, but I do want to emphasize on how important it is not to store one of these lithium ion batteries in a vehicle on a hot day. As these high temperatures can push the battery's voltage past its critical threshold and cause severe damage, if not worse. You can't keep me from my trail. I will find a way to it. There she is. All right, and so begins our journey. Used a tiny bit of pedal assist to get here, but nothing consequential. So for this really rough patch, we're just gonna use pedal assist one, go through here pretty slow because this is really rough gravel. I don't like taking any of the other bikes on this, but this is fat tire, so it should be nice. Once we get past this, which I think is two miles, we'll go ahead and kick up the speed a little bit. No helmet today, simply because it's gonna be really hot. I'm gonna be on a trail the whole time, not dealing with traffic. This is a pretty flat, well-kept trail, and I'm not pushing high speeds. That is some loose gravel. I know I can be a bit of a broken record, but I absolutely love the sound of rubber over rock. The camera actually doesn't do it justice. This gravel is a lot looser than it looks. If you've ever tried to ride next to a railroad track, this is basically the same thing without the tracks, as that's what this used to be. Everyone's choice of riding style is going to be different, but for me, when it comes to electric bikes, I like to help the motor whenever I can to extend the range. But I do have one rule for today's trip. I have to stay as comfortable as possible, essentially taking advantage of this actually being an electric bike. I'm not allowed to break a sweat. Um, this type of trail is really going to suck up our mileage on electrics. They really shine on smooth, flat roads. They're really efficient. This is going to be 100% trail ride. Right now, we're pretty much just in sand. Pedaling uh, in this stuff is gonna make a big difference in your mileage. I can't wait till they finish this trail. Definitely don't want to fall down there. But in case any of you guys are wondering, this is what we're on. Just over 60 miles if you do the whole thing. When uh, this section finish, I think that'll bump it up to 65. old railroad marker. I'm going to assume that just means that it crosses a road. OK, 
Took me about two and a half miles to remember I'm on a fat tire bike. And I don't have to ride on all that gravel if I don't want to. Although the side of the trail is not much better. The pine needles give a bit of cushion. Nice little improvement. All the uh, silent treatment we gave it. I hear very, very few things rattling on the bike. Coming up on the fork, we stay right for the trail and left might someday be another part of the trail. I'm not sure, but I think it's private land. I think that says yard limit. Maybe there was a sawmill here or a quarry or something. I don't know. So many of our great adventures have began and ended right here. And at 12 miles an hour. I've got a nice breeze. I feel like I can still maneuver if an unexpected obstacle shows up. It's just fast enough to enjoy, but slow enough to be aware of your surroundings and react. No guardrails. Definitely do not want to fall down there. Now the long stretch begins. Slowing down or stopping to try and get pictures or cool shots is a bit of a challenge. The bugs are really bad. They go straight for the back of my neck too. Um, I have an inflator, some tire sealant, but God help me if I have to stop and fix a flat that's gonna suck fifty one point five volts looking good I don't know how well you guys can see it but not only does this display have a voltage readout, mileage, time, you also get a current readout. Now current and voltage is actually really useful uh, for e-bike guys when you're going on long trips or you're pushing it hard. It gives you a better sense of just how much you got left and what you can expect to get out of the battery. Now, these numbers aren't going to mean anything to you guys at first. Through the magic of video editing, I can come in in post-production and explain this as simple as possible. Or of course it would be a lot easier if they would just put a watt meter on these displays. I have no idea why they don't. You basically just take your current battery voltage, at the moment being 51.5 volts, and multiply it by how many amps you're pulling. And since this readout has both a voltage and amp readout, we can tell you what it is. 
With our current trail conditions, we're pulling 1 amp. At 51.5 volts, that's 51.5 watts of power being used on average. In a moment, we're going to bump it up to level 3, which will put us at 18 miles an hour. But this small jump in speed significantly increases the amount of power used. We go up to 3 amps. So 3 times 51.5 is 154 watts. That's a big difference. This is a method you would use to estimate your range for companies who advertise their batteries in watt hours instead of amp hours. For the most part, this is just technical data for the advanced rider that's not too useful for anyone else. Now, the degree of precision and accuracy in these readouts can always be questionable, and there is inefficiencies in the system. But you can actually use this method to estimate how many watts you're giving to the bike as well. While in your desired pedal assist level, spin the pedals without applying any pressure, essentially letting the motor do all the work, take your readings, and then begin applying pressure to the pedals as you normally would, take your new readings, subtract, and there you go. You have the amount of watch you're giving to the bike as well. Is it useful? Probably not. Is it entertaining? Definitely. In my opinion, the only important piece of information you need to know to estimate how much range you have left is your battery voltage. And you always take voltage readings while you're up to speed and under load. Now for bikes with different voltage of batteries, there are different charts, but because the 48 volt system is the most common, I'll leave a link in the description to this very simple bit of information that will help you out if you're new to e-bikes. In the beginning of the video, I stated that this is a range test for people who actually care about the longevity of their bike. And this is important because these batteries really do not like to be drained to their minimum capacity. So knowing this information and using the chart, I shot to have a 20% battery buffer at the end of my trip. Not only would this give us a reserve in case we ran into any unexpected detours, but more importantly, it would bring us home with a well within safe limit battery voltage. Let's see if we can get ourselves something to eat. I've never been to this place before. They just built it. Hello. Cool. Never been in here before. Well, welcome here. <laughs> You guys build this for the trail? Um, or just because Calvin needed something? Calvin needed something more so. Burger. Cheeseburger. 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 You too. Y'all are both having a burger early. We'll it is it already goes. hot. We sat out there for a little bit this morning, but it's hot. So I used to go to Goldana, get a BLT, and then come back. Now I got you guys, so if I can't make it, I won't go home hungry. <laughs> Let me know if you need anything. That's a proper burger. <laughs> That's a good burger. All right, back at it. We're leaving the S&J's Butler Pantry. That is a cool little place. The perfect location. It's just the right size for this small town, too. through all the trouble to soundproof the bike. I did a good job, but then I put the sack or a seat on it. Very comfortable seat, but very squeaky. So I've noticed a couple different styles of speed controllers and how their pedal assist will keep you at a certain speed. There are modules that have what I call dynamic power delivery where the throttle or the pedal assist will target a speed and then it will apply as much power as needed or as much power as it has available to keep you at that speed. The Varla Eagle One scooter and the KBO Breeze 
use that kind of dynamic power delivery system. It is convenient. Has a couple drawbacks, but on stock equipment where you're not tampering with the setting, um, it should be fine. This one has an amperage controlled system. You'll notice now we're in pedal assist two still. I'm still in gear five. But our speed's dropped a little bit. We're not at 12.2 anymore, we're at 11.8. This controller doesn't target a speed, it targets an amperage. And pedal assist level two, I think, maxes out at three amps. Well, wattage is just amps times volts, here's your watch. So as the battery voltage starts to drop, the controller is still going to do 3 amps at max. Since you have less voltage, you'll have less available power. I like this system um, because the amperage is limited, you'll never overheat the motor, you'll never overheat the battery no matter what kind of terrain you're going through. Now, obviously, if you gun the throttle to punch through it, well, the throttle is going to give you all the power that you want. But in the pedal assist levels, up to five, because five is unlimited, is basically full throttle. Up to level four, it limits the amperage. So even if I was to go up a steep incline, it would never overheat the motor or overstress the battery. The dynamic system, they will just keep applying more and more power. So even if your incline increases, you're going uphill, it'll feed more power to the motor to try and keep you at that target speed. So say the KBO breeze, if we're riding it right now, even though the battery would have dropped in voltage, the controller would have compensated and we'd still be cruising at that 12 miles an hour. So 8.6 miles plus 5.1. 9, 10, 11, 12. 13.7 miles. We've gone 13.7 miles. And my voltage is at 48.4. On my chart, I told myself that I should turn around at 48.6. Oh, went back up a little bit. So we're still bouncing around the 48.6, which is, if, if my math is right, meaning that we use 40% of the battery. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can at least get 15 miles here, which we're coming up on. And that means on the way back, that'd have been a 30 mile round trip of only trail riding. All right, so ideally we wanna be home at 44.2 volts. That's 20% battery capacity remaining. All right, 6.4 plus 8.6. That's 15 miles in one direction. So we're gonna go ahead and turn around at this road up here so it'll be easy to find on Google Maps. So we can double check our range, make sure everything was right. And we touch the road. Okay. This is the 1233 North that we're intersecting. God, these little freaking biting flies are everywhere. So I can get moving again.
still had enough power to climb that steep hill. Oh, not much left in her. 44.8 volts. Well, I have to say. So there you have it, guys. A 30 mile round trip on this bike is pretty impressive, in my opinion, especially considering that was all trail. And fat tire bikes aren't known for their amazing efficiency. The large tires have more drag than skinny road tires. But then again, what else are you going to take on a trail like this? I was pleasantly surprised to see that our numbers lined up quite well with what we were hoping to get on the return trip, and even having a little more voltage than I intended. Now, I have no doubt that we had a significant amount of mileage left in the bike if we decided to continue this trip on a smooth street. But under those riding conditions where there's a lot of drag on the bike, I don't think she had much left. And again, this is a practical range test where we're not draining the battery completely, which is just something you're not supposed to do anyways. We got home, examined the bike, and everything looked good. She handled it like a little tank. As far as the frame, motor, and battery is concerned on this bike, I'm impressed. However, I feel they need to address their cable management system. Cramming the controller in the frame like that is something that's going to be a liability for sure. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.